What is success for you? Everybody has their own definition of success. Some people define it in ways that it is an end objective. There are others who will say success is being our maximum potential, arriving on a journey, and never a destination, but success is whatever it is we choose to be. I want to encourage you to listen to Alan, who by a lot of definitions is very successful, but not to the degree that he wants to be. Let's listen. Hi there, and thank you for joining us on the Overcomers Overcoming podcast. We feature those who are in the process of overcoming or have overcome any type of life encounter, life obstacle that at the time seemed to be almost insurmountable. With this podcast, we have three objectives in mind. Our first objective is we want you to know with a confident resolve, you're not alone. We want to work with you. We want you to know there are others who are working with you, who want to help you through whatever you are encountering. And together, we will get through whatever you're experiencing. Our second objective is There are multiple options for any life encounter you are facing. We want to help you develop a resolve that there are various options and solutions to any life dilemma. Our third objective is to help you with critical thinking skills. If you're encountering something that was possibly a decision you made sometime in the past, And if you had the opportunity for a life redo, you would make a different decision. We want to help you with those critical thinking skills that can help you make an informed decision and not encounter what you're going through at the moment. We are the Cooper Culture, a veteran-owned business. We work with business personnel and families to develop and sustain connected relationship cultures within their families and organizations. That type organization is one where people feel wanted, appreciated, and genuinely a part of that organization. I'm with my wife and business partner, Marty, who has helped me facilitate this podcast. Today, we feature Alan Lazarus, who is very successful by a lot of traditional definition, but he acknowledged in this session that he's working on himself, that by some monetary standards, very successful, but not totally fulfilled with everything he's doing. And he acknowledged he's working on that. We addressed the EQ, PQ, SQ, and IQ. He acknowledged being very high in IQ. He's working on his PQ, physical quotient, SQ, spiritual quotient, and EQ, emotional quotient. Marty, what are some takeaways our listeners can gain from Alan? Ron, as we listen to Alan tell his story and how he thus far has transformed his mindset, we heard his passion to help others create a full life of success and fulfillment. And Alan has a great story of mental transformation. Let's listen and learn together. Alan, great to have you with us. Our listeners are going to be very interested in learning about your life experience. I just a little bit I know of you. You have made a life transition from what it used to be to who you are. You have experienced, uh, by your own terms, some challenges, some, I'm going to use the term failings, that, well, that didn't work, but you Uh, just pushed on beyond that. And it it seems, Alan, no matter what it was that did not work, you did not feel like a personal failure. You just said, well, that, that won't work. I'll just keep going until I do find something that does work. Alan, our listeners are going to be very interested in learning just how you have made it through various phases of life to become the person you are. Great to have you with us, Alan. Thank you for having me. I looked at your podcast logo and I saw the two different paths. And then there's a little sign that says your choices create your destiny. And to me, personal responsibility is everything. Like 
I think a lot of people, they go through life and they think that life is happening to them. And it is. And I grew up in a very adverse childhood, which we can talk about. But essentially what I figured out has made the difference because I've been wondering my whole life, how did I how did I go from so many adverse childhood experiences, losing my dad, losing my stepdad, uh, losing three families in a way we'll get into it by the time I'm 14 to to a life that is successful for lack of better phrasing and holistic and healthy and that kind of thing and and how is it that some of the people that also grew up in those adverse challenging times didn't make it out they still have that same drama trauma triangle that they're kind of stuck in and still just trying to make ends meet and and what was the difference and what i've figured out is the difference is i took personal responsibility because i had self belief and if I didn't have self-belief, I wouldn't have taken personal responsibility and and more importantly, personal responsibility for my choices. And I think that that's what your podcast is about. So I'm really grateful to be here. And I do think that ultimately our future is determined more by our choices than any other single factor, who we choose to spend time with, what we choose to do, how we handle adversity, whether or not we believe in ourselves or not, and then particularly educating ourselves um, when bad things happen and that kind of thing. So I'm um, really grateful to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you. I tell you, uh, several topics come to mind just in that very brief description. One, resilience. I had, our listeners are going to be very interested in knowing, are you naturally resilient? Did you have to develop that? And two, your attitude is, I'm not a victim. I will make it through these kind of things. Alan, I, I just have a sense you're a very conversive type person Take any, take either of those two words and any other topic for that matter. Resilience. I'm not a victim. How, how was it you recovered from what some people may say, boy, I tell you what, if that had happened to me, I, I may have ended up in drugs or whatever. Yeah. And so that's, I really appreciate it. I really, really do. And I don't take it lightly. Uh, I've been trying to figure out that my whole life because where I grew up, I, I playfully refer to it as the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. And really what it was is I looked around and my mom and my stepdad, uh, so I'll give you some backstory briefly. So when I was two years old, my father passed away in a car accident when he was 28 years old. I had an older sister who was six. My mom was 31. She was a stay-at-home mom. And she didn't know what to do because my dad made all the income. And so uh, my stepdad came into the picture when I was three. And from three to 14, I had a stepfather. So my real last name is actually McCorkle. So a lot of times when people hear Lazarus and they see blonde haired, blue eyed me, they go Lazarus because Lazarus is a Greek last name and I don't have a hair on me. Right. So, um, the, he, my stepdad was Greek. I'm actually Irish, Polish, German, Scottish, I think, but I'm from a, a big Irish Catholic family. So my, my birth father, John McCorkle, my real last name is McCorkle came from a big Irish Catholic family. Jim, Joe, John, Jane, Joan, Jeanette. <laughs> wow. RJ. Yep. And so John McCorkle, my dad, he passed away when he was 28. And then my stepfather came into the picture. I took his name, my stepfather's name, around age seven. And we were trying to be the Lazaruses, so we didn't really associate much with the McCorkles. So there's the first family, kind of gone. Again, I didn't understand any of this. I told you I was on a therapy call before this. I, I didn't understand much of this at the time. So I, it's only in hindsight rewatching the movie of my life that I started to realize all this because I really didn't get it. But anyways, so stepfather leaves when I'm, when I'm 14 years old, takes his entire extended family with him, also takes 90% of the income with him. So I playfully refer to 3 to 14 as boats and BS. It was, I mean, he had a motorcycle, we had snowmobiles, we had, we did deep sea fishing, we... We had a yacht. We had an apartment building. It was also the 90s. The 90s, everyone was doing very well. Not everyone, but a lot of people were doing very well. And the dot-com bubble. And so my my stepfather worked for a company called Agfa. And they did hospital computers. So we did very well. And it was basically when he left, it went from... So he got the apartment building and the yacht. We got the house and the dog. And... I went from Xbox, Dreamcast, early Christmas presents, upper middle class, uh, and my mom and stepdad liked to party, and that's putting it very politely. They did not get along. That's also putting it very politely on a public medium. But when he left, he took 90% of the income with him. I haven't talked to him or a single one of his extended family um, since. 
I, I spoke to him a little bit on Facebook Messenger, but not in person. At that same time, so I went from basically upper middle class doing very well, sort of the my friends think I'm rich, quote unquote, we live on a lake, snowmobiles, ski trips, all that stuff, to basically I get free lunch at school now because our income is so low. I have to bootstrap my way to even go to college. Um, I shop, shop at Salvation Army. We weren't going to starve by any means, but we were, you know, my mom traded in her BMW for a little. I knew how to do. And this is where I guess the resilience piece comes in. There's four trauma responses when adversity strikes. And the psychology says this. So there's fight, flight. Most people know those two. But then there's freeze and there's fawn. So fawn, so so by the time I'm 14 years old, birth father has passed away, haven't seen the McCorkles, stepfather leaves, takes the Lazaruses with him, sister moves out that same year when I'm 14 with her older boyfriend. That same year, my mom gets in a fight with my Aunt Sandy, her sister, and my Aunt Sandy ostracizes us from that whole side of the family. So didn't know this until my 30s, and I'm reflecting back and realizing that 14 was the hardest year of my life, but essentially... I lost three families kind of by the time I'm 14 years old and talking about the abandonment and all that stuff. So, uh, luckily the McCorkles took us back with open arms. They were kind of like seeing the ghost of Christmas, Christmas past a little bit because they, I looked just like my, my dad, John. And that was the first time they'd really seen me much of me since I was two and a half. So anyways, I didn't realize this at the time, of course, cause I'm just a kid. I don't know what the hell's going on. But ultimately, my I had two trauma responses. One was fawn. I became a social coward. I mean, just appease, appease, appease. Please don't hurt me, appease. But on top of that, behind the scenes, I fight. It was fight. It was aim higher, work harder, get smarter. To the nth degree. I mean, to an extreme extent. I had two dreams. One was I was going to be engineer, MBA, Fortune 50 CEO of a tech company like my hero, Steve Jobs, I used to argue. I built my first computer at 12 and I used to argue with my friend who was going to be, who was smarter, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates back in the 90s. Um, and it, Or it was going to be lawyer, politician, president. And I know that sounds weird, but I genuinely calculated like that's what I'm going to, I'm going to do one of those two. And I had a bunch of other side dreams like pro gamer and fitness model and all that stuff. But, and I did some of those, but at the end of the day, that was my, my goal which was, okay, the past sucks, the present kind of sucks, I'm going to build the biggest, brightest future ever because I don't have a safety net, I don't have a dad, I don't have a, a trust fund, like there's no, there's no one who's going to come save me. So I'm going to have to figure out how to aim higher, work harder, get smarter. So I got straight A's through all of high school. I got into my dream college, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. It's like a mini MIT. It's one of the best engineering schools in the world. And it was $50,000 a year. So I had to get tons of academic scholarships and financial aid. Fortunately, I got a lot of financial aid so I could go. I went there. I got my computer engineering, bachelor of science, and then I got my master's in business administration. And then I was off to the races. And to me, when my stepdad left, we were broke. So I thought wealth was going to save my family, essentially. And so I worked for iRobots and Sada Technologies, Lens Americas. I worked for a company called... Um, Tyco safety products. I worked for a bunch of different tech companies. I eventually landed at a company called Cognex. Computer engineers do very well in the economy today because everyone needs them. And so I did really well. I went from 65 to 85, from 85 to 105, 105 to 125. And then I eventually landed around $180,000 a year. In my early 20s, I paid off 84 grand worth of debt in a single year. I had $150,000 in an investment account for Vanguard. I'm in my early 20s and I'm a 1% global earner, not America, global earner. And I'm doing very well. My rent is 600 bucks a month. I split it with my girlfriend. We live on a lake. I don't have a mortgage. I bought a $5,000 car, 2004 Volkswagen Passat. And to me, I didn't need much because I grew up with so little after my stepdad left that I just invested all my money. Fast forward, I get in my own car accident. I'm 26. I'm up in New Hampshire with my little cousin. We're not drinking or partying or anything. I'm supposed to yield. I don't. The snowbanks were covering the signs back in 2015 up in New Hampshire. I end up on the wrong side of the road. I look up, see the brightest lights I'd ever seen, what I thought was a Mack truck. Two things saved my life in hindsight. Number one, it was not a Mack truck. It was a lift-kitted pickup truck. There's a lot of those in New Hampshire. 
And number two, I was driving that 2004 Volkswagen Passat. Thank you, Volkswagen, because I used to call this car the tank. German engineered steel trap of a car. The whole front end completely smashed in, but the frame stayed. And both airbags deployed. Me and my little cousin are physically okay. He hurt his face on the airbag. I hurt my knee on the airbag. Or no, he hurt his knee on the airbag. I hurt my face on the airbag. But we were physically okay. Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, though, not okay at all. Because this is the second chance my dad never got. I've seen the pictures of my dad's car. I've seen the pictures of my car. They do not look very different. So this was my quarter life existential crisis of like, what if everything I've ever done was wrong? What if I was running from my pain? You know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? What if that was it? I was filled with all these regrets. And you had mentioned in your question, a lot of people who have adverse childhoods ends up with drugs or alcohol. And I did have some of those problems. I drank too much and too often. I had high school friends and I had college friends and I had corporate friends and I was partying. And in hindsight, I just was not living a life true to myself. And so in hindsight, it's very clear. I was successful, but deeply unfulfilled. And then I flipped the script after that car accident. I actually became deeply fulfilled. I worked on healthy, happy, productive fitness model, fitness coach, fitness competitor, live in my dream, public figure, podcasting. But I went broke. So I went from successful and deeply unfulfilled to super fulfilled, but unsuccessful. So I couldn't sustain it. And so now here I am nine years later. And now, unfortunately, I'm in the bucket that we all want to get to, which is both successful and fulfilled, which I actually think is really hard to do. I actually think being successful is fairly easy. I think being fulfilled is fairly easy. I think doing both simultaneously is very difficult, very, very difficult. And then if you want to do both and be in love like you two, that makes it even harder. And so well, that's what I do now is I try to help people with that. Alan, gosh, what a great, great, great story. There is an aspect of your life that you could have felt abandoned because, and you could have felt a victim because you didn't have a father as a role model, but you were very intellectually astute, it seems. And so you knew you could. That's what I'm discerning from your, what you're describing so far. Somehow, some way, I will. And you had that, I'm reading into this, you had the determination, but I'm also reading into this that, yep, I can be as successful as I want to be. I'll just keep moving until I get there. But of all the things I'm doing, of all the things I can be successful at, you hit a key. I think it's very important. How can I be both fulfilled? That is, I'm totally gratified in what I'm doing while also being successful, however we define that. And you mentioned therapy, and we haven't gone there to do a whole lot of that yet. But yet, what I'm envisioning, Alan, I'm really reading into this, and I'm not a psychic, is that, okay, there is an aspect of your mental health and that in the context of fulfillment that you're still you you are very successful, but yet you're still working on some aspects of your life, and you know exactly what needs to be worked on. Now, Alan, I've I've worked I've put a whole bunch into that, and again, I'm not a psychic. That's what I think I'm discerning from what you're describing. But Alan, I want to add, you also mentioned love, so relationships are very important to the fulfillment of a successful career, having money in the, in the checking account, but love is very important also. Yeah. hundred percent health, wealth, and love. So health, I think is physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Uh, wealth is how you make your money. Do you actually, does what you do fulfill you? Is it meaningful work? How much do you make? And is that increasing or decreasing? And then what do you do? Where do you invest it? Where do you spend it? And then love, which is your intimate relationship, friends, family, colleagues, clients, mentors, mentees. And ultimately, I think most of us are either professionally developed or personally developed. Very rarely do you find someone who's both. I'm working on being both. Um, but for me, success always came fairly easily. Easy. It was the relationships that were really hard. And so I'm working on, I always joke, I say, if you want a coach, you need a therapist. If you want a therapist, you need a coach. So I had dozens of mentors and coaches in corporate and blah, 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 right? But I, what I needed was therapy. And so um, ultimately, I, I appreciate what you said there, which is I do realize that without my intellect, I don't think I would have ever gotten here because through all of that, and this is only in hindsight, 
I've always wondered too, why certain people who were in my childhood didn't make it out to the same extent that I did. And I think what it has to do with is self-belief. And now the question, the existential question is, why did I believe in myself so much? Is that because of my brain could actually calculate it? Because a lot of people say to me, well, Alan, you believe in yourself so much. And I say, yeah, but it's not hard to believe that you can make chocolate cake when you have the recipe. My brain can reverse engineer finish lines. So Kevin, my business partner said, like, how did you know we'd be successful at podcasting? And I said, because you can't add that much value to that many people's lives for that long without being successful. I mean, I just know how to build a business. And a lot of people don't. And and I think that that's just, well, not, not just because of my MBA, but just in general, I've always been studying businesses. I've always studied success. I've always been a scientist. So I wonder to myself, if it wasn't for my intellect, if I would ever have been able to climb out of some of those dark spaces. Talk to us about love, Alan. Was there a part of your life, maybe in the early beginning, that without having the father figure as a role model, and I'm nothing in that is accusatory, but you could have felt that way. Did you go through a period of your life where you felt unloved or you were just uncertain where you were? Yeah, I, I actually think, so my sister and my mom raised me for the most part. And my sister always loved me unconditionally. My mom uh, was always showering me with love. And, and again, we all think our parents did some things really well and some things really poorly. And I've told my mom that at the end of the day. And we still have a relationship today. But ultimately, I would say that the abandonment at 14 probably created some level of unlovable. And that's a core wound that I still carry. And now that I'm aware of it, though, it's interesting because you you recognize when it gets triggered and then you can realize that most of it is is just fear. Uh, and, and I think that relationships for me were actually challenging mostly because of my drive and my hunger. So one of the things that an adverse childhood can do, not always, but it can, is create a, a lot of grit, a lot of resilience and a lot of drive. So I grew up and I'm, I'll be transparent. This is actually very scary to share, but I grew up thinking everyone was unintelligent and and lazy. When in reality, I'm just really smart and really driven. I But I didn't know that. I don't go through life like I'm so smart and I'm so driven. I mean, if anything, I actually think I'm not smart enough. I mean, I think I'm smart enough in terms of statistically, but I want to be smarter. That's why I'm still reading and still learning and still growing. And so it's this weird thing where relationships become exponentially harder the bigger your goals are. And so I, it wasn't until I found someone who had higher goals than me prior to meeting me that things really started to, to work in my intimate relationships. Okay, let me ask you about that someone. Did, was, did that someone become a mentor of sorts? Did, that, did you learn from that person how to maybe love yourself, how to, how to love? And I'm really, I'm building on mentorship in love. Yeah, you're very intellectually right there. But yet, if the total package is not there, you're not going to achieve your potential. That's where I'm coming from. Yeah. So, Emilia, greatest gift of my life. Met her five years ago. She's the one who helped me understand the inner work. I didn't understand the value of self-love and self-acceptance and self-compassion and self-respect and boundaries and keeping the promises you make to yourself and stuff like that. I was a type A achiever who was going to grind his way to whatever success was going to be in the opposite direction of the the crap I grew up in. And she's the one who really helped me understand how to love who I am and encouraged me to do that. And she loves me unconditionally to such a drastic extent. So that's been unbelievable too. And in many ways, I, I mean, there's no way. There's no way I'd be the man in front of you right now if it wasn't for Emilia. I mean, even the therapy work that I did earlier today, but I've been doing for maybe a year, year and a half now. That was a suggestion she made. And it wasn't, hey, Alan, you're broken, go fix yourself. It was not that. It was, hey, Alan, I've been doing therapy for decades and it's been magnificent how much it's helped me understand myself and emotional intelligence and emotional maturity and all these things. Because ultimately, and I think statistically men know this, we're, we're, we tend to be less humble. We tend to be less emotionally intelligent. We tend to be less holistic. I mean, let's just be honest. And if you're offended by that, it's probably because it's true, by the way. 
Um, <laughs> and so I think ultimately I always joke, I say, guys can't even ask for directions. Never mind, get a therapist, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> every woman's rolling her eyes right now. It's great. But at the end of the day, I just realized, you know, you have to eat the humble pie and you have to realize that I want to be the best man I can be. And the only way I can do that is to be more than intelligent. So for me, it's STEM BIF, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, business, and finance. Like for me, that's my genius zone. That's what I'm good at. That's what I've always been good at. And in the 21st century, you can very easily succeed with just that. Some of my colleagues in college are doing that, but they're emotional children who still play video games at night while their wife is miserable. So um, I just, I don't want to end up like that. I want to be holistic and I'm still working on that for sure. Alan, I'm going to ask you a very personal question because as I'm discerning what you're saying, you have a, a very notable IQ, whatever it is. And I, I don't care what the number is at this point, but I think what you're saying along with this is your EQ was low. You are improving your EQ, EQ your emotional quotient. And when you get the two of those at the right level, the same level, you are probably going to be maybe approaching where you choose to be. And I, again, I don't want to come across as a psychic. I'm not, but I would <laughs> just comment to what I just said, Alan. Yeah. I think ready and lefty, right. Ambidextrous. And and the truth of the matter is my IQ is significantly higher than my EQ and IQ was always easy. I mean, I got straight A's through all of high school. I got 189 in honors English. Of course it was English, but I didn't have to try that hard. Right. And um, that kind of stuff always just came easy for me. And it, if anyone's seen the movie Goodwill Hunting, I, I my MySpace when I was 17 years old, I had a clip from Goodwill Hunting on my MySpace. And and the reason why that movie resonated so deeply is because I felt very, uh, I felt very connected to his character, where uh, the abandonment and and the 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 sort of intellectual genius stuff and feeling misunderstood and feeling undervalued, but also, you know, huge potential and you know needing needing a male role model with robin's robin williams character and all that so i didn't realize why i loved that movie back then back then i just thought i loved it now i realize okay that makes sense uh but it ultimately yeah so my eq i'm working on i would say i was definitely emotionally immature and i grew up in a in an environment of emotional immaturity for sure which didn't make it better and i think a lot of men are emotionally immature quite frankly and i think very few of them are willing to admit that and I, I definitely, the car accident woke me up and, and really helped me become more holistic, which I think in order to be fulfilled, you have to be holistic. You can't, I mean, who wants to be Steve Jobs who, who didn't take care of his health and passed away at 57, right? So in many ways, he's a hero of mine because of his vision and his work ethic and his focus. But in other ways, he's definitely not a hero whatsoever. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I, I think you need EQ and IQ. I think you also need PQ, which is physical quotient, and then you need SQ, which is spiritual quotient. And um, I'm trying to have all four. You're hitting on some just core values we need to uh, emphasize. I want to pr uh, project, Alan, have you think in the place of the listener who is might be saying right now, yeah, I've done well in school, but I, I too have been emotionally ab ab abandoned and I have a low EQ and yes, my PQ physical quotient and SQ spiritual quotient may also be low, but I, how would you work with that person? How, how would you tell that person to, to some degree, take time yeah. out, take an hour out of your life, whatever, and assess who you honestly are. Uh, how would you, how would you help that person out of the rut, so to speak? Yeah. So I have an AP calculus teacher that I coach. He's a multimillionaire and uh, he, he owns rental properties. So he, he's a multimillionaire on paper and, and he's brilliant. He has a 136 IQ and I love talking to people like that because we can just, we can just go. Um, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that he's, and I told him this, you're, you're only scratching the surface of your potential. And you know it, by the way. Like, uh, honestly, some people are actually maximizing their potential. I mean, not all our potential is equal. So some people look at me, they're like, you're in such great shape. You've done so great. And I appreciate it. But you've got to understand, for me, what's impressive for Michael Jordan, and I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan, but like, 
what's impressive for one athlete is not impressive for another athlete. So you have to filter everything through your own potential. And we all have different potential. I mean, if you think I'm wrong about that, go play basketball with LeBron James. You're going to lose every time. It's not going to be close, no matter how hard you work at it. So at the end of the day, this this high IQ person who needs more SQ, EQ, and uh, PQ, I, I essentially said this to him. I said, listen, you believe in yourself a lot. You're brilliant. We both know that. Uh, that's great. And I'm I'm as smart as you or smarter. And I know you know that because it takes one to know one. I'm not impressed. You are barely scratching the surface of what you are capable of and you know it. And he went to his wife, who's also in our group coaching program. And he said, I've never heard anyone talk to me that way like that. And it ignited him. I mean, he's on fire now. And, and the truth of the matter is people who have really high self-belief, you can be a little harder on them. If someone doesn't have self-belief, you got to be careful because they if someone already feels bad about themselves, the last thing you want to do is make them feel worse about themselves. But this dude already feels like he's the man and he is. That's the problem. You're a big fish in a small pond and you know it. Let's go, sir. And so the medicine you give to one patient is actually deadly to to another. And so that's why I like coaching better than podcasting because it's one-on-one -on -one and it's custom. Uh, so everyone listening right now, if you don't have a 136 IQ, if you're not a multimillionaire, and if you aren't brilliant and everything comes easy to you, none of none of what I just said will resonate. If anything, you might think I'm an arrogant butthead. The truth of the matter is, is we're all on a spectrum. And there's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, which we've talked about. And he needs his EQ to come up. And the truth is, I had to get underneath his emotions and his self-concept and get him to realize that he isn't maximizing his potential. And just because everyone else is impressed around him doesn't mean that he's impressed deep down. Because ultimately, that's what matters, right? Are you proud of you? Are you proud of you? You know what you're capable of. And if you're beyond your own capabilities, congratulations, you're maximizing your potential and you are fulfilled and aligned. But if you're not... You do know that deep down and that does eat at you. And there is a way to ignite that drive to really get back in alignment with your true potential. Two things come to mind, Alan. One, you have a coaching business. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. How would a person business. contact you for the person, the listener who's resonating with this podcast and saying, man, I just, I like everything Alan is saying. I believe he can take me through and get me out of where I am. How would a person contact you? Well, so the, the, the main thing that I do in coaching, it's business coaching. I, I started coaching seven years ago and it was mindset coaching. It was peak performance coaching and it was life coaching and it was all these business consulting. And eventually I landed at business coaching. So, uh, Ultimately, though, the point of the coaching is to get you out of the doom loop. The doom loop is I don't believe in myself, so I don't take action. When I don't take action, I don't get results, which makes me what? Believe in myself even less. A lot of people are in that doom loop, and most people are in that doom loop in some area. So for some people, it's fitness. For some people, it's business. For some people, it's their career. For some people, it's their love life. The success loop is the opposite. It's inject some belief and some clarity and certainty take messy action, be willing to fail forward, and then get results, which then reinforces the belief. And so you just start gaining momentum. And so if anyone's interested, you can email me, A-L-A-N at nextleveluniverse.com. You can go to nextleveluniverse.com, the website, everything's on there. Or you can check out our podcast, Next Level University, spelled just like it sounds. The website and the podcast are two different names, though. Next Level University for the podcast, Next Level Universe for the website because the person who has that URL is charging way too much money. <laughs> I want to ask you another question, Alan. It's a little bit unfair to a degree uh, while we're recording, but our listeners need to learn more about PQ, EQ, and SQ. And I understand there are many hours that could be devoted to that. But for the listener who it just has a slight feel for that at this point. And they're saying, you know, I'd really like to learn more. Would you consider coming back for another podcast to discuss at least at a superficial level, what those are in the benefit of PQ, EQ and SQ is to the personal life? Of course, this is one of my, I mean, the three things I'm mainly focused on is coaching, training and podcasting. So I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to come back for sure. 
Alan, I'm going to ask uh, ask you to to uh, schedule a time where we can do just that because I know that our listeners are intrigued with the positivity, the certainty, the resolve with which you speak. There are those that say, I think I can get there, but I'm not there right now because I'm in some sort of maybe an emotional rut. And I believe you are the right person, Alan, who can help our listeners through that to become who they're created to be. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This has been very, very, very awesome. And uh, ultimately, this is what I wish I had when I was growing up, which was just more more injection of belief and more injection of bigger, better, brighter future and and uh, more guides that are trying to help people become more fulfilled and more successful. And so I'm grateful. I'm honored. I really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll definitely do that. We'll schedule that for sure. Alan, you've just said another thing that's, I know what is happening in some people's lives. I just wish I had someone who could inspire me, mentor me, coach me, whatever the term may be, to believe better in myself. It's not a point of arrogance, but it is a matter of, we do have to have a self-belief to get beyond where we are. Alan, you're a great inspiration. We look forward to having you again. Thank you so much. We appreciate having the opportunity to share our and our guests' life's experiences with you. The Cooper Culture advances organizations to achieve and sustain high retention rates, connected communication, and trust through personality insights and principled leadership. You can contact us at our website, thecooperculture.com, and you can contact us directly at ron at thecooperculture.com or marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at thecooperculture.com. We work with you to help assess aspects of your culture to advance the environment and people to their best performance. We do that through our staff of certified personal performance coaches, leadership trainers, keynote speakers, and disc personality behavior experts. You can book a speaking engagement directly through our website by contacting us at ron at thecooperculture.com. We look forward to sharing our life experiences with you, some of which are profound, some of which are pretty funny. Some of those life experiences are ones we'll never do that again because we've been through stuff. We truly look forward to working with you, speaking with you, helping advance you in any way that we can.